hello again. Right, we start with the second set. Um, and this one is a reading of an extract of a book by Ralph Whitlock, written in 1945, called Peasant's Heritage. Everything was new and bewildering. I began to wander aimlessly through the forest of hurdles and sheep, but after being roundly coursed, forgetting in the way, on some half a dozen occasions, I judged I had best make for some wide open space. There was a meadow some distance away, and I thought if I could reach it, I should be able to get my bearings. So I did my best to travel in that direction, but it was pretty hopeless. After being turned back from every quarter by flocks of sheep and hard swearing shepherds, I found myself at last in a little blind alley with small likelihood of getting out for an hour or so. Then Providence suddenly drifted along in the shape of Bunny Daney, a chum of mine, who had come to the fair with his shepherd. Watch her, Bunny, I cried. Where's going? Bunny struggled into my corner and grinned helplessly. Glad to be out of the crush, we clambered up the bank hedge and looked down upon the whole fair. And so I think um, Ralph's talking uh, from his early days uh, when he was young and he was just um, an apprentice to a shepherd. Uh, he, he eventually uh, learned a good deal of um, sheep husbandry and other things and actually became a farmer in his own right. And you may well know of him um, in terms of local studies. He wrote books. So he really, really, really became really well known. The other half of the ground was reserved solely for sheep and every square foot was fenced in by hurdles. Without any exaggeration, 30,000 sheep must have come to Britford Fair in those days and practically all were Hampshire Downs. We had had enough of sheep for the time being and naturally, wishing to see something new, decided to make for the lower part of the field. By devious ways, we eventually contrived to get there. The chief attraction of this region was the ponies. There were half wild creatures of all colours, ages and sizes that had arrived in the early morning in large droves of 50 or 100 with a few old horses to guide them. They came from the new forest. We spent nearly an hour examining them, trying to make friends with the colts and stroking the noses of those that were too shy. At every corner and in every vacant space were cheap jacks selling all manner of wares, collar studs, knives, thimbles, watches and chains and scissors. We watched a man selling knives. His method was highly complicated, but he left his audience, though slightly bewildered, firmly convinced that he was giving away something for nothing and ruining himself into the bargain. He selected a solid and intellectual looking labourer from the crowd and, bringing him to the front, told him that he was about to be given something that would make the other folks green with envy. In one hand, he placed a knife and a shilling and asked his victim to give him the shilling for the lot. To this, the man agreed and handed over his shilling, whereupon the cheap jack launched into a long and flowery oration calculated to confuse his hearers, and he took care to keep the knife and the shilling. At the end of the speech, he substituted a half crown for the shilling and asked the labourer to give him first a half crown, then a crown, and then a half sovereign, and then a sovereign, and the hesitating yokel paid up every time. In the end, the labourer, he gave the labourer a sovereign and the knife, and the poor fellow went off as pleased as punch. It was only when he worked it out carefully at home that he saw how he'd been cheated. If you would take trouble to do likewise, you will find he paid 18 and sixpence for the knife. Meantime, the incident has its desired effect on the crowd. The cheap jack did a roaring trade and told his trumpery knives at exorbitant prices. For sixpence, I bought three pairs of scissors, with which the cheap jack cut steel and iron, but when I took them home to mother, they would hardly cut cloth. About the sharpest swindler I have ever come across was, I think, the man who was selling flea sticks at a certain fair, or perhaps he ought to be classed as an astute practical joker. The flea sticks, he said, were invaluable and would make an end of all small vermin in a very short time. They were in little brown paper parcels, which on no account were to be opened until the sticks were required for use, as exposure to air destroyed the active principle, which made the sticks so effective. Hmm. We shall find the printed instructions inside on the packet. Would you have been fooled? Well, I bought two packets for sixpence, and the first one I opened as soon as I got home, intending to use it in the dog's kennel. Yes, there were the sticks with instructions wrapped in them, but the sticks were used matchsticks, and the instructions stated, Place the flea on one stick and hit it on the head with the other. 
I reckon that cheap Jack deserved to get away with it just for his cheek. In one corner of the fairground, we found the man selling quack medicines. The solution I have in this little bottle, he was saying, is the balm of Galeed and will cure lumbago, rheumatism, sciatica, growing pains, neuralgia, asthma, rickets, indigestion, constipation, flatness of, flatulence of the stomach, measles, quinsy, mumps, um, and many other ailments, all for one and six. Goodness me, it's a definitely a good cure-all, don't you think? Gentlemen, I will go further. You have a shrewish and scolding wife at home. Ah, I see it by the way you wince. Well, you just hide this little bottle in your waistcoat pocket, and when you get home, drop a little of the liquid in your wife's teacup. For an hour or two later, she will become sweet and docile in spite of herself, and never again will you be tormented by her acid tongue. Goodness me, do people actually believe these things? Okay, so that one's um, the second part of this today's theme, which is uh, markets. I'll now, and fairs, I'll now move on to the last one. So I'll see you in a moment.